You have one life to live. Are you making the most of it? Is it the best it can be? How does one live the best life? A serious question, so I did what all of us do when we confront serious questions. I Googled it. I came up with 10 tips for the best life. I'm not going to share any of them with you. <laughs> not one of them mentioned what the scriptures teach. That the one who wishes to save his life must lose it. That our best life happens when we give it away to God. Father, as we come now to your word, we sit under it, we humble ourselves before it. Pray, Lord, by your spirit that its strength and its power would penetrate us. Speak to us, Lord. Move us. Change us into the people you want us to be. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in last week's message, we spent some time looking at the conversation between Moses and and God, where God is making it clear the call that he wants to place on Moses' life. And Moses is raising objections. We went through five of Moses' objections, uh, to be exact. And this morning, we're going to circle back to this conversation. We're going to linger over it just a little bit more uh, to see if it might be helpful in shaping our thoughts and hopefully in shaping our practice when it comes to the call that God places on each of us. If you've got a Bible with you, please turn to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning and you look under the seat, you'll find one that looks like this or in the seat in front of you. Black Bible like this. If you don't own a copy of God's Word and you'd like one, feel free to take that one. That would be our gift to you this morning. We're in Exodus chapter 4 and... Um, you're reading along in this Bible, that's page 55. I'm going to start in the 10th verse. So the 10th verse, we're jumping kind of into the middle of the story here, right? We know back from uh, chapter 3, Moses is out tending sheep on, on the side of Mount Horeb, and he spies a bush that is aflame but not being consumed. That catches his attention, and he thinks he should go investigate, which he does. Out of that bush, God calls to him, Moses, Moses, and he says, here I am, and then ensues a conversation between the two, Moses and God, where God lays out to Moses this plan that he has for Moses to be the agent, the one who goes into Egypt to set the Israelites free, and Moses, of course, has some questions about that, and he wants to know, um, who are you that I should go, and he wants to... to throw out in front of God, well, who am I? I'm not qualified. And then he raises the idea of, well, what if people don't believe me? And to every one of these objections, God is answering and giving him an acceptable answer, something that should uh, comfort his heart. And here we uh, come back to verse 10, where Moses is continuing to debate a little bit. And he says, oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, which I I just stop right here. It's really kind of a neat little thing you might read over real quickly. But what is Moses saying? He says, listen, I've never really been good at this speaking thing, not in the past, and actually you haven't fixed it since we've been talking. <laughs> like you haven't cleared this up, so it remains an issue. We want God to fix things when we want him to fix them now, don't we? He says, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. And the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then, this, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he's coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he'll be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the sign. 
Well, let's start this way. Moses might have been the first prophet that we read about in Scripture to cite his lack of eloquence um, as a disqualification, but, but he, he wasn't the last. When Isaiah had a vision of the Lord and he saw the Lord, he said he was high and lifted up. Uh, <coughs> when he came face to face with the Lord, he said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Kind of the same thing. I'm not qualified to do what you want me to do. Woe is me. And then there was Jeremiah when he first got the call of God on his young life. He replied to the Lord. You can read it, Jeremiah 1.6. Oh, Lord God, behold, I don't even know how to speak, for I am but a youth. But responses like uh, these are, are what has led somebody to craft the old saying that God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Christine Kane, in her devotional Undaunted, shares the same idea in a different way, but she writes this. She says, if he calls us to slay giants, he will make us giant slayers. If he calls us to the task, he's going to provide us with what is needed to, so that we can do the task. I want you to consider this morning the story of Gideon. Most of you are familiar with the Bible character Gideon. He lived at a time when his people were uh, in great distress, when the Israelites were being oppressed and they were in danger. We first find him uh, in the scripture in uh, pressing wheat in a wine press so that he won't be discovered, so he won't be seen or found out, so the Midianites won't come in and, and take his wheat or do bad things to him. But what's interesting is that the angel of the Lord greets Gideon, and he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, Gideon was, at that point in his life, anything but a mighty warrior. He was a scared man, a timid man. He was not a leader of people in any sense. But catch this. God knew what Gideon would become. God knew what he was going to do to transform Gideon into the man that he wanted him to be. Our concern over uh, a lack of eloquence, Moses' concern over a lack of eloquence, Jeremiah, Isaiah, any unnecessary. We don't need to worry about our lack of eloquence because effectiveness in witnessing, effectiveness in speaking God's truth doesn't depend on eloquence. Some of you today, I think, are probably hesitant to share your faith because you're worried that I don't know what to say and I don't know how to say it. I think probably you know more than you do, but let me tell you this. The effectiveness, your effectiveness in witnessing doesn't depend on your eloquence. God is the one who does the saving. The Apostle Paul was criticized, you might be surprised to know, for his speaking ability. You think of Paul, you think of a, a powerful and a dynamic man responsible for uh, so many church plants and so many conversions, but he was criticized for his poor speaking, 2 Corinthians 10.10. 10. He'd heard about the critics and he wrote this, for some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in purpose he's unimpressive. And his speaking amounts to nothing. That's the Apostle Paul. He seems to be a great writer, but apparently he's not a very good speaker. I was privileged to go to the Gospel Coalition Conference last month. This church sent me and five other guys. And all of us there were blessed to hear from some of the best, most eloquent preachers alive today. These are, this is the cream of the crop as to what contemporary Christianity has to offer. John Piper, Tim Keller, H.B. Charles, G.A. Carson, David Platt. These are Christian powerhouses. Rob Morang ran over people to get to the front row. <laughs> Listen to David Platt. He apologized. <clears throat> No, he didn't, but he really was anxious to get there and hear David Platt. Each of the guys that I just mentioned is wonderfully gifted. They are so eloquent in the way that they speak and present the gospel. They are the type of preachers and speakers that all of us preachers and speakers want to be like. But it seems like the Apostle Paul wasn't like... He might have been articulate, but I guess he wasn't very riveting. Have you heard about the young man named Eutychus that we read about in Acts chapter 20? 
I'll read you just a short passage, Acts 20, verses 7 through 9. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, that's the people, at Troas, where they were, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. So the ESV says talk still longer. The King James says long preaching. And the NIV is best. It says talked on and on. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. So usually we can say with some degree of safety that listening to a long sermon isn't going to kill you, but not in the case of Eutychus. He fell out the window and he died. I'd, I'm so tempted to move on, but now you're sitting there going, what happened after that? So I'll tell you because I always seem to tell half stories, and then when I'm shaking hands, everybody's, what happened? So Paul, after this happened, Paul stopped speaking, stopped preaching, went down, took the young man in his arms, healed him, brought him back to life, went back upstairs, had some supper, and then continued to preach until daybreak. Yes. But my point is this. Paul might not have been the most engrossing speaker ever. Uh, he said it himself, and he said it of himself, 2 Corinthians eleven six. 6. Even if I'm unskilled in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge. I might have a hard time get, getting it out, but I have a message. Might not always be clear the first time, but I've got something to say. That's who Paul was. He had something to say, and he said it. And what did he say? He said it was his joy and his glory to preach Christ and him crucified. In other words, he was, he was all about sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, preaching Jesus and preaching that cross. And he wasn't always great at it, but he always did the best that he could. You know what? That's all God ever expects of any of us, to do the very best that we can. And then to trust him to supply anything that's needed beyond our best. That's how it works. You apply yourself to the things of God. Beloved, he'll fill in the gaps. He'll take care of the rest of it for you. When Jesus sent his disciples out two by two, he told them this. He said, as you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Now, I think in, in modern Christianity, we can read over this passage of Scripture from Matthew chapter 10 and go, okay, yeah, that's nice. But I'd like us to stop for a second and see what Jesus is telling his disciples. You go preach that the kingdom of heaven is near, and at the same time, you heal the sick, you raise the dead, you cleanse those who have leprosy, and you drive out demons. In other words, there's a kingdom. It's unlike any kingdom that you've ever known. In that kingdom, there is no sickness. There is no power of death. There is no strength of disease, and there is no marauding evil. This is the kingdom that is near, and this is the kingdom that is in Christ. This is the kingdom that is to come, beloved. The kingdom spoken of in Revelation. So Jesus said, go out there and preach this message of what my kingdom is like and what it's going to be like. He said, freely you have received, freely give. So be liberal. Give what you have. And don't take any gold along or any silver. Don't take any copper in your belt. In other words, no money, no currency. Don't even take a bag for your journey. Don't take extra sandals. Don't take an extra tunic. Don't even take a staff. Don't take anything you think you're going to need to survive on this mission. Why? No money, no extra goods, no extra clothes, no sandals, not even a staff. That kind of sounds this is a little echo of Exodus here in this passage. The wilderness journey. Remember we read about the Israelites in the wilderness when their footwear never wore out. You didn't have to worry about what to wear because God was going to provide it. And that staff, we just read about that staff where Moses is told, make sure you take that staff. And here Jesus is saying, you don't even need a staff. Why? Because God is going to be there to provide you what you need. Don't take anything into this mission because God 
is going to give you everything you need when you need it. The same passage of Scripture looks ahead to the end times. <clears throat> and speaking to his disciples about the end times, Matthew 10, verses 19 and 20. Jesus says, but when they arrest you, don't worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. God is prepared to supply every need in every moment to accomplish his divine purposes through his people, up to and including giving us the very words he wants us to use. Moses is concerned that he doesn't have the words, the ability to speak. But God tells him plainly, in verse 12 of Exodus 4, you go, I will help you speak. I will teach you what to say. And I would say to you, Christian, if you have any hesitation whatsoever about sharing the gospel with anyone, you go. He will teach you what to say. And he will give you what to speak. <laughs> Philip Ryken, when he assesses Moses' objection regarding his eloquence or the fact that he, he didn't know that he would have the right words, decided that the job that Moses was given isn't really that tough. He says, Moses didn't have to be an orator. He just had to be a reporter. To be a reporter, faithfully repeating whatever God said to him. And you know what? The same is true for us today. God's not asking his disciples to go out and make up a story. Jesus said, you shall be my what? Witnesses. You shall be my witnesses. A witness doesn't have to go out and make up a story. In fact, that makes somebody a bad witness. A witness just tells the story. This is what I know to be true. And that's what we're told to do. That's what Jesus wants us to do. What we know from Moses, from Paul, from others who've cited their limitations, but their reluctance to share God's word, is that the message is more important than the messenger. Let's think about that. A message is more important than the messenger. It was a winter day in London, January 6, 1850. The snow was so heavy that day that 15-year-old Charles Spurgeon couldn't make it all the way to his home church where he was used to worshiping. He could only go so far, and when he got to the end of that, he decided he would duck into what was called then a primitive Methodist church. It happened to be handy, and it was a good one for cover. And in he went. And he said in that chapel on that wintry day, that blizzard day, there were a dozen to 15 people. The minister couldn't make it because he was snowed in. So he said a poor man, a shoemaker, a tailor, or something of that sort, he didn't even know what profession the fellow had, went up into the pulpit to preach. Virgin says he was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had nothing else to say. The text was Isaiah 45, 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. He didn't even pronounce the words right, Spurgeon said. But that didn't matter. He began thus. He said, my dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. Now that does not take a good deal of effort. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It's just look. Well, a man need not go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool, and yet you can look. A man need not be worth a thousand a year to look. Anyone can look. A child can look. But this is what the text says. It says, look unto me. I, said he, in broad Essex, many of ye are looking to yourselves. No use looking there. You'll never find comfort in yourselves. So I mentioned that I came across 10 tips for your best life that I'm not going to share with you. They all point to yourself. But this humble man says you'll never find comfort in yourselves. He's right. He followed up his text in this way, though. Look unto me, capital M. I am sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me, I'm hanging on the cross. Look, I am dead and buried. Look unto me, I rise again. 
Look unto me, I ascend, I am sitting at the Father's right hand. Oh, look, look to me. And when he'd gotten about that length and managed to spin out ten minutes, he was at the length of his tether. Then he looked at me under the gallery, and I dare say with so few present, he knew me to be a stranger. He then said, young man, you look very miserable. Well, I did but I had not been accustomed to have remarks made on my personal appearance from the pulpit before. However, he said, it was a good blow struck. He continued, and you will always be miserable. Miserable in life and miserable in death if you do not obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. Then he shouted as a primitive only a primitive Methodist can, young man, look to Jesus Christ. As Spurgeon wrote, there and then the cloud was gone and the darkness rolled away and that moment I saw the sun. And I could have risen that moment and sung with the most enthusiastic of them of the precious blood of Christ. Was it a good sermon by sermon standards? No. No, one could legitimately take issue with this man's exegesis and his application. Was it delivered by a good speaker? No. No, he couldn't even pronounce some of the words right. And if it weren't for the storm, that man never would have ventured into that pulpit. It's likely to say that he never ventured into a pulpit again. But look at what God did with the unprepared, repetitive, but heartfelt and simple words of an obedient servant. What if he hadn't the nerve to speak? What if he argued with the Lord about why he shouldn't? What if he grieved the Holy Spirit on that day and refused to obey? Remember this, friends. God made the world out of nothing. Right? So nothing intimidates the Lord. He can make something out of anything that is offered to him in obedience. Or how small or flawed it, the gift that you bring, he can make something out of it if you will give it to him. So back to Moses. He's got a problem. He, he's arguing with God. We touched on this real problem last week. The heart of the matter for Moses is he doesn't want to obey. He offers excuses to why he can't obey. He sets up criteria that has to be met in order for him to decide to obey. But the reality is what's driving all these uh, conversations is the fact that he doesn't want to obey. He just doesn't want to acknowledge God's claim on his life. It seems like Moses is asking, why me, Lord? And not really in that kind of pathetic, why me, Lord, but more in the sense of, if you, if you have uh, siblings, or if you're a parent and you've, got, you've had a few kids at the same time in the house, Moses is asking why me the way a sibling asks when they're assigned one chore and another is not. Why do I have to do that? Why can't she do that? What's the matter with him? That's kind of what it's like, because it follows this whole thing. Please, send someone else. Why me? Why me? There's got to be somebody else who can do this. Pastor Kevin DeYoung, when he deals with this text for this, he, he kind of goes all over the place, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. He, he, he uh, runs the gamut of the Bible, starts this way. He says, when you avoid your calling, when you say, why me to God? When you avoid your calling, when you question the Lord, he says, you might end up in the belly of a big fish in the middle of a lake somewhere. So he's taken us out of Exodus and over to Jonah and uh, threatened us uh, with, this is what happens when you avoid God's calling. And I, I'm, I love this because I'm like, that's not what happens, Kevin DeYoung, for crying out loud. Bring that to Sunday school and tell these kids, if you don't follow God's calling, you're going to get eaten by a fish and watch him come screaming out in panic. It's the same thing as telling the kid, you, you keep looking at me cross-eyed and your eyes are going to stay that way. No, they're not. That's not how it works. But there are some consequences 
for running away from God's call. They really are. And so he asks, he just says, will you serve God with whatever strengths and weaknesses he's given you? Will you speak in his name? You might think, I can't. God isn't going to use me to save people. You don't know the people in my life. They're so far gone. They don't know Jesus. They don't want anything to do with him. God cannot use me. And Kevin DeYoung says, well, he spoke through a donkey. So give yourself a chance. God calls and we say, why me, Lord? Why? But he's not answerable to us, right? We do understand that. God does not have to explain himself to us. And besides that, if God answered all the why questions that we have, the ones that we ask out loud and the ones that we keep hidden down deep in our hearts, if God answered all the why questions that we have, there would be no need for faith. And it is faith that truly pleases God. In fact, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because he delights in it when we trust in him. He delights in it when we, when we prove our trust in him by being obedient to him, by taking the steps that he wants us to take. So the Lord calls us, he makes a claim on our lives, and we say, why me? And I say, why not you? Why not you? Gladys Allward is probably not a name that rings a bell for most of us. It would, have, would not have meant anything to me if I hadn't been able to be at BYC last year um, during a week when the, the camp pastor, um, Alex Oaks from the Baptist Church in Pittsfield, read to us in the evening chapel from a little book called The Small Woman, the story of... Gladys Allward, a woman who faithfully followed the call of God on her life and became a missionary to China in the early 1900s. Now, she in, endured countless hardships in this journey. You can find that book or a little synopsis of it. I'd encourage you to go and see that. And, and so Alex would read that every night, and he always seemed to end right when something big was going to happen. <laughs> Time and again, leaving us in suspense. So it was wonderful to read about all that she went through. She wanted to be a missionary. God put it on her heart to be a missionary. So she studied to be a missionary, but she didn't do really good on those missionary exams, and her grasp of the language wasn't all that it should be. And so she really wasn't accepted that way, but she continued to work and save her money. She saved enough for passage to, to China via train, and she ended up selling all her possessions and going over there. And once she was over there, she wasn't easily received. She was viewed with skepticism. People didn't want to listen to her, didn't always accept her help, and there was all kinds of conflict going on in the country that she found herself embroiled in and engaged in, armies coming and going and having to lead people away from the danger. In the meantime, she was always so faithful to serve and to persevere, rescuing orphans counseling government officials. The story is fascinating about a young woman who gave her life to God and then did things that you and I would say are impossible. And they are impossible when they're attempted in the flesh, but with God, all things are possible. Gladys had wondered in her, in her young life why she was so small, why she had dark hair instead of the blonde hair of her siblings, why her eyes were black when her siblings' eyes were blue. The answer to those questions is that God made her uniquely for the work he intended to call her to do. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. God made Gladys uniquely for the work that he intended her to do. He knew he would call her to do it. The specific work that, that would bring him glory. And he made Moses the same way. And he's made you the same way. The question Moses had to wrestle with was, would he trust God? Would he obey God? Would he surrender his life to God? Would he give himself 
to God? Would he say yes to God's call? So that's, that's the question that Gladys settled when she sold all her worldly possessions and boarded the train to China. And that is the question each of us must settle also. We have one life. Who and what will we live for? Will we walk in the works that God has prepared beforehand for us to do? Or will we just try to do this whole thing on our own? We have one life, and it goes so fast. What will we spend it on? What will we give ourselves to? I suspect you know how I would counsel you even what I'm going to say next. But I'd like to borrow some other preacher's words from a sermon given January 6th, 1850, where a man stood in the pulpit and said, look to Jesus Christ. And sing our closing hymn this morning. It's number 592 if you're looking in the hymnal.